Okay, welcome comrades to this uh, talk on uh, Marxism and pacifism. Uh, their moral or ours. Uh, my name is uh, Stefan. I'm uh, with uh, the Swedish section of uh, the International Marxist Tendency. And it's my privilege uh, to chair today's uh, session where we're looking forward to a number of contributions. from experienced activists in uh, different sections of the IMT. From uh, those of you, for those of you joining the school just now, you will note uh, pauses when uh, people speak, including me. Uh, this is uh, because the school is actually translated into a dozen different uh, languages. Chinese, Spanish, all the main European languages uh, really, so we have to give time for the comrades to translate what is being said. Uh, now, to see the schedule for the school, go to the event page and uh, click the star button. You can find translations on the same page by clicking on the speech symbol. And our uh, main speaker, in this session will be Ben Glinetsky from Socialist Appeal. And uh, he will be uh, speaking for uh, 90 minutes, including translation more or less. We will have a 25 minute break and then we have four uh, other comrades intervening. And uh, after that, uh, I will ask uh, Ben to sum up the discussion. So that's our plan for this session. So I should also say that Socialist Appeal is the British section of the IMT. And uh, I will just, uh, with those brief words, hand it over to uh, Ben to introduce this important discussion. Welcome, Ben. Thank you, Stefan. Okay, comrades, last year there was a revolution in Sudan. The revolutionary movement was very powerful. It threatened a fundamental transformation of society. And the total destruction of the old regime. The ruling military junta understood that the only way to preserve itself and crush this mass movement was to terrorize it. So they unleashed a militia. called the Rapid Support Forces. This was a militia based on the most backward elements in society. And they rampaged through the protest areas, 
looting, beating, raping and killing. And the regime terrorized the movement's leaders into a deal which leaves the military effectively in control in Sudan today. Now the only way to stop the looting, beating, raping and killing The only way that the aims of that revolution could have been carried through would have been to arm the working class, give them weapons to defend themselves, set up committees of self-defense and kill the militiamen. The working class needed to be armed by appealing to the ranks of the army to join the revolution and disarm the militias. Violence here was not an abstract question of theory or morals or philosophy. For the revolution, it was kill or be killed. Now, the leadership of the Sudanese revolution, which to its credit went very far in organizing the struggle, nevertheless sacrificed the revolution on the altar of pacifism. And it was congratulated for doing this. by reformists and so-called lefts all over the world. One of these Sudanese leaders spoke at a conference of the Democratic Socialists of America last year. Jacobin magazine published an interview with her. And she said, one of the things that kept us alive is that we were peaceful. No matter how they tried to provoke us to use violence, people wouldn't. No matter how many times they tried to kill and rape girls and put us in prison, People have a lot of anger, disappointment, sadness, but we kept ourselves peaceful. It wasn't easy, but that's how it was. Now these warm pacifist sentiments are of little use to all those workers who were beaten, raped and killed fighting military dictatorship in Sudan. Nor are they useful to those who continue to suffer under it today. The events in Sudan last year prove, not in theory, but in practice, 
that pacifism is poison in the revolutionary movement. Now this, this civil war waged by the Sudanese military leaders against their own people, was to protect the interests of the Sudanese ruling class and the imperialists. And this is the same as the driving force behind modern war between nations. That is the clash between the different, the interests of different capitalist states. Which in the last analysis are the interests of big banks and monopolies. The modern capitalist state, which wages war, and it wages war now against its own people, now against a rival state, At all times, it is acting simply as a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. And that bourgeoisie requires violence. The natural evolution of a system of production for exchange has created the concentration of wealth and the monopolization of the forces of production by a tiny handful of people. And this produces antagonisms between classes as the ruling class tries to maintain the exploitation of the workers and between different cliques of bourgeois represented by their own nation states driven by capitalist competition. Now, the capitalist class has many weapons at its disposal to fight the workers of its own nation and the capitalists of other nations. Uh, such as propaganda or diplomacy. But in the final analysis, history shows us that naked force is the only method by which capitalism can temporarily resolve its contradictions and maintain itself. Uh, and this is important, write this bit down. War is not an external aberration to capitalism. It's not a mistake and it's not an accident. It is built into its foundations. Throughout history, the aim of any ruling class has always been economic advantage. Force has only ever been a means to achieve that. War is waged not for its own sake, but to conquer new markets, raw materials and spheres of influence. The famous military theorist Clausewitz, 
He said that war is the continuation of politics by other means. And politics, as Lenin said, is concentrated economics. So the laws and the logic of war, politics and economics are not separate, they are intertwined. 10 minutes, man. Leon Trotsky pointed out that the aims of an imperialist peace are no different to those of an imperialist war. Capitalist states, even in peacetime, are organized systems of violence. for the exploitation and oppression of the majority by the minority. Through the police, the army, the courts and the prisons. These violent methods of class rule to preserve bourgeois interests domestically they find their twin in wars abroad. So what conclusion do we draw from this? Only the overthrow of the capitalist system and class society can put an end to war. Using class struggle, we must break the repressive forces of the bourgeois class. Whether they're used domestically or internationally. This is our policy, both in times of capitalist peace and in times of capitalist war. In times of bourgeois peace, we might use strikes, for example, to split the workers from the bosses. eventually with strike committees and workers' councils as alternatives to bourgeois state power. We would demand the nationalization under workers' control of key industries. And many other things. This is how we break the repressive power of the ruling class. In times of imperialist war, our policies have the exact same aim. Adapted to the different circumstances. In the Second World War, Our tendency was the only one to avoid either impotent pacifism or reactionary chauvinism. The British Communist Party, by contrast, adopted both the positions of pacifism and chauvinism, one after the other. Both of which isolated them from the advanced working class in Britain. We adopted what was known as the proletarian military policy. 
The British workers at that time instinctively understood the threat posed by fascism to the working class. And they wanted to fight Hitler. And we encouraged this, but without making any concessions or giving any support to Churchill or the British ruling class. We agitated for strikes among workers against the big capitalists profiting from the war effort. We called the workers to arms, to join the struggle against the Nazi armies, but then also agitated among the soldiers for their democratic rights. against Churchill's use of the British army against Greek partisans, for example. At all times, we exposed the imperialist character of the British ruling class. We aim to break the repressive power of the ruling class by breaking the commanding rule of the officers in the army. Our policy towards war then was not pacifist, but it was designed to smash capitalist militarism. I didn't get any Spanish translation on that. Don't know if that's a problem with me. Uh, ben, I can still hear the Spanish uh, translation. It might be a problem on your end. Okay, one second. Apologies, comrades. Okay. Could a Spanish translator say something for me? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Thank. You. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, right. So, in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels explain the connection between war and class struggle. They say. In proportion as the exploitation of one individual by another will be put an end to, the exploitation of one nation by another will also be put an end to. In proportion, as the antagonism between classes within the nation vanishes, the hostility of one nation to another will come to an end. What this means is that we are for class struggle, and the proletarian socialist revolution in our own countries. 20 minutes have gone. At all times. Unlike the pacifists. For whom class struggle is secondary in a situation of war. 
we aim to strengthen the class struggle in times of peace and in times of war. Naturally, we use different methods dictated by the circumstances. But always with the aim of weakening or breaking the repressive forces of the bourgeois class. Now, the war which should have been waged by the Sudanese revolution against the military junta could have broken those repressive forces. And so despite the violence and the bloodshed that would have caused, which we condemn as an inevitable product of class society, such a war would nevertheless have been historically progressive. Because we're not for or against war in general. We base our policy on any given concrete war. Wars waged for the liberation of oppressed people and classes are progressive and we support them. But wars waged in the interests of imperialism even if they are described as defensive or for the right of nations to self-determination, are reactionary and we oppose them. And this is important, write this down also. The violence used by the slave owner to keep a slave in chains is not the same for us as the violence used by the slave to break those chains. All of these ideas are a closed book to pacifists who see nonviolence as a moral norm obligatory upon all people for all time. But society is not governed by fixed or abstract morality. It is governed by the struggle of living historical forces expressed through classes. Now, part of the role of Marxists is to expose the causes of war. and to analyze any given war's historical significance. And to tell the truth to the working class about capitalism and imperialism. Meanwhile, the ruling class deliberately obscures the objective basis for war. They appeal to the abstract idea of pacifism as a, as a calculated deception to mask the real class-based nature of their actions. <laughs> 
In 2003, George Bush and Tony Blair said that they wanted to invade Iraq to destroy weapons of mass destruction and secure world peace. In fact, the Iraq war was about oil and nothing to do with peace. Similarly, Woodrow Wilson won the 1916 US presidential election on a pacifist program. Woodrow Wilson. Now it suited the US ruling class to avoid war at that time. so that it could profit further from arms sales and profit generally from the war. This, Wilson's slogan of peace hid imperialist interests. But within a year, the interests of US imperialism had changed. And that same pacifist led the United States into the First World War. This is the cynicism with which the ruling class treats the idea of pacifism. The Marxists see through this hypocrisy. But the petty bourgeoisie and the reformists do not. They believe the lies of the bourgeois about their desire for peace. And they consider war to be the product not of the insoluble contradictions of capitalism, but of individual madness or mistakes. This is why the leaders of the Second International, so-called Marxists leading social democratic parties, voted in favor of the First World War. Because they believed the propaganda of their own ruling classes that they were fighting a defensive war for peace against bloodthirsty foreign enemies. And this is also why Jeremy Corbyn, the former leader of the Labour Party in the UK, has swallowed the bourgeois lie that the United Nations is a force for peace. Capable of persuading imperialists to avoid war. 30 minutes gone. Reformists believe that the ruling class can be persuaded not to go to war. For the same reason why they believe that capitalists can be persuaded to grant economic concessions to the working class. Fundamentally, they, they replace a materialist analysis of society with philosophical idealism. They do not understand how the capitalist system really works. That it cannot afford concessions or peace 
in a time of crisis. Those leaders of the Second International adapted themselves to conditions of capitalist upswing prior to 1914. And that upswing softened relations between classes and between nations. There were enough profits to keep the imperialists happy. And even to afford some concessions for the working class, so everybody was happy. The social democratic leaders therefore believed that capitalism had resolved its contradictions. They saw struggle between classes and between nations as external to and unnecessary for development. And, and Jeremy Corbyn's ideas likewise are the product of the post-war boom. A period in which class antagonisms were less acute. He believes that austerity and war therefore are purely ideological questions. untouched by the laws of capitalist development and crisis. But the point is capitalism cannot resolve its contradictions. It can only temporarily overcome them for a period of time. such as the years before 1914 or the years after the, after the second world, the second world, second world war. But when the contradictions inevitably rise to the surface as they did in 1914, for example, struggle again becomes necessary. between classes and between nations. And under those circumstances, those reformists who have adapted themselves to class compromise and gentle international diplomacy, they find the ground cut away from under them. but they still try to cling to that position of independence, separation from struggle. And they therefore adopt the idea for which there is no basis in theory or practice that it is possible to secure peace by methods outside of the class struggle and the socialist revolution. Such as pressure, for example, pressure on the imperialists. They do this and they call themselves pacifists. In reality, of course, any real pressure for peace has only ever been the result of the revolutionary struggle of the working class for power. It was not 
liberal petitions, but the October Revolution in 1917, which extracted the Russian workers and peasants from the First World War. It was not pacifist pleading, but the German Revolution of 1918, which brought that war to its conclusion. And it was not moral pressure, but revolutionary councils of action and a dock workers strike, which forced the British to withdraw the army from invading Soviet Russia in 1920. So what, what flows from this understanding of pacifism? Pacifism, as Trotsky said, is nothing more than the servant of imperialism. Pacifists help imperialists cover up their crimes. By painting them as ideological mistakes by individuals instead of the inevitable product of capitalism and imperialism. Pacifism provides an outlet for discontent while guaranteeing no real opposition. Now, the United Nations embodies this pacifist impotence. It is a circus where small nations air their grievances while the big ones veto anything which goes against their interests. The General Assembly of the United Nations has repeatedly approved resolutions condemning Israel's violence in Palestine. Only to have them vetoed by the United States in the Security Council. What a mockery of the UN's so-called peacekeeping role. And equally, the United Nations is powerless to prevent the big powers going to war whenever they want to. The 1999 bombing campaign by NATO against Kosovo did not have UN approval. Nor did the invasion of Iraq in 2003 by the United States and the United Kingdom. In 1960, the UN sent a peacekeeping force to what is now Democratic Republic of Congo. And that resulted in the murder of Patrice Lumumba, the Congolese Prime Minister. and the dictatorship of Mobutu, who was a tool of imperialism. This is the powerlessness of the United Nations. 
The UN is an elaborate display of pacifism, which is completely hollow on the inside. And pacifists who celebrate the United Nations are consciously or unconsciously servants of the imperialist interests which it conceals. 40 minutes. 40 minutes. They encourage the dangerous illusion that fundamental contradictions within the capitalist system are simply ideological points of view which can be changed by persuasion. Now, Leon Trotsky was, sorry, that doesn't, that doesn't need translation, um, was merciless in his criticism of pacifists, who he saw as diverting the attention of the masses away from the real processes at work in society. He explained that you do not eliminate the danger of war by, for example, disarmament. His pacifist slogan, disarmament. He said, a program of disarmament while imperialist antagonisms survive is the most pernicious of fictions. The imperialists do not make war because there are armaments. On the contrary, they forge arms when they need to fight. And we could say the same thing of NATO or other imperialist alliances. Some pacifists advocate dismantling NATO to avoid war. But is it military alliances which cause war? Or is it the inevitable capitalistic tendency towards war which makes imperialist alliances necessary? Abolishing NATO will not resolve the fundamental contradictions of capitalism. And it is those which are the driving force behind war. The pacifists mistake cause for effect. So against the pacifists, The Marxists say, we can only fight imperialist war with civil war against the capitalist class. Our slogan is not for peace, but for class war. Our enemies are not the workers of other nations, but the international bourgeoisie. Starting with the ruling class of our own countries. This is the finished program of Marxism. But we must connect this finished program with the mood of the masses at any given time, which is unfinished, confused, contradictory. <laughs> 
So in most cases, the desire for peace among workers is healthy. It's not, it's not reactionary pacifism. Uh, it's a healthy reaction against imperialism and bourgeois hypocrisy. Our, our role then is to point out the hypocrisy of the bourgeoisie when they talk about peace. And explain that the capitalist class has never been a reliable guarantor of peace. because capitalist competition between national bourgeois cliques inevitably leads to war. We also want peace. But only a worker state in our country and all others can guarantee it. And that requires class struggle. Around, for example, transitional demands such as those put forward by our tendency in Britain in the past. Like state expenditure on public works instead of on weapons. like the nationalization under workers' control of the armaments industry. Or like mi military bases being brought under the democratic control of the working class. So just because workers desire peace, it doesn't make them necessarily reactionary pacifists. And likewise, if workers have a desire to fight, that is also not necessarily reactionary. Such as the mood among workers to fight Hitler in the Second World War. Or the mood among the masses of an oppressed nation to fight for self-determination. In such situations, the proletarian military policy that I described earlier must be applied. And this also requires class struggle. Around specific demands such as strike action against war profiteers. 50 minutes. 50 minutes. And it requires us to try and split the ranks of the army away from the bourgeois or petty bourgeois officers of the army. So in all cases, whether the mood of the masses is for peace or for war, and taking into account all the historical and local peculiarities. We must aim to break capitalist militarism 
and highlight the need for the working class to pursue a policy independent of the interests of their own capitalist class. And where this happens, even in a limited form, it can have a very big effect. Last year, a Saudi ship docked in the Italian port of Genoa. to collect weapons for use in its imperialist war against Yemen. The dock workers went on strike and refused to load the weapons. The Italian Trade Union Confederation supported the strike making other Italian ports also off limits for the Saudi ship. And so the ship left empty. So class struggle struck a greater blow against imperialist war than any liberal pacifist NGO had been able to do. The imperialists understand this power that the working class has. It was, it was bourgeois fear of mass domestic discontent which prevented a ground invasion of Kosovo in 1999. and which prevented the bombing of Syria by the UK in 2013. One of the reasons behind more peaceful relations between the USA and the Soviet Union in the late 1980s was the fear of revolutionary upsurge in the super exploited ex-colonial countries. And the Vietnam War was lost for the United States, not only in Vietnam, but in the United States itself when the majority turned against it. This is the power of the working class struggle to disrupt the imperialists' plans. So Marxists want to turn imperialist wars into civil wars. And we consider the wars to liberate oppressed nations and classes to be historically justified. We have no abstract moral opposition to violence. But does that mean that all methods of waging these wars are permissible from a Marxist point of view. No. <laughs> 
For example, individual terrorism and guerrilla struggle, on their own and disconnected from a mass movement, do not strengthen the class struggle. They substitute the actions of a minority or even just an individual for the collective action of class struggle. It doesn't strengthen the confidence of the masses in themselves as the only force that can overthrow class society. And in fact, it strengthens the repressive apparatus of the state. which adopts harsher powers and methods for dealing with so-called terrorists. So, so these methods actually only strengthen the forces of bourgeois violence. Our approach to such methods of struggle is not a moralistic question, it's a tactical one. Only those methods of struggle which make the working class conscious of its role in changing society should be used. For decades, the appalling violence of the Israeli state against Palestine has been met by acts of individual terror. But these have failed to destroy or even to weaken the state of Israel. A mass appeal to the workers of Israel by a revolutionary Palestinian leadership would have had a far greater effect. There are huge protests taking place in Israel now. The country is not one reactionary mass, it's divided into classes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. Israel has national service, which has the potential to be a transmission belt for the mood of the Israeli youth into the army. But instead of basing itself on mass methods of struggle, the Palestinian leadership has too often based itself on terror. The first intifada, which began in 1987, had a mass character. 
but it took place over the heads of the PLO leaders. As well as mobilizing the Palestinian masses, it, it had some limited effect in Israel itself. And it led to real results with the Oslo Accords, although they solved nothing fundamental. This is the way to fight. Instead of these methods, the focus on terror has, has widened the gap between Palestinians and those Israeli workers and youth who could have been won over. And today, the idea of splitting the Israeli army is very, very distant, if not impossible. Now, in the future, this could change. But this is the legacy of individual terrorist violence disconnected from an organized mass movement. It has weakened the Palestinian struggle. So look, in, in general terms, we are opposed on the one hand to the pacifist slogan of disarmament. And on the other hand, we're opposed to individual terror or guerrillaism. Against both of those, we can't oppose independence in the industrial and political policies of the working class which requires the arming of the masses and the splitting of the army and the winning of the army ranks to the working class struggle. Now, the petty bourgeois and the reformists, they say that arming the masses and splitting the army is unrealistic. But it has happened. Repeatedly, in re in revolutionary situations all over the world and throughout history. In 2002, an attempted coup against the Venezuelan president, Hugo Chavez, was thwarted, <clears throat> sorry, was thwarted where the ranks of the army broke with their officers. Under pressure from the mass movement, they sided with the masses. In Italy, <clears throat> sorry, in Italy, there were factory occupations by workers in 1920. One newspaper reported, 
the workers number former military pilots in their ranks who yesterday brought aircraft into action. One state official wrote a report. He said, it seems the occupiers have machine guns. They claim to have armed a tank built at the Fiat car plant. Now these red guards were not simply armed individuals. They were organized groups of workers under the democratic control of the workers organizations occupying the factories. via an elected military committee. Another example. In 1956, there was a revolution in Hungary. Against Stalinism and for genuine workers' democracy, not for a return to capitalism. The Soviet Union invaded Hungary to put down the revolution. And this is an eyewitness account from the chief of police in Budapest. We saw an immense crowd arrive on the street. We saw three large Soviet tanks coming from the opposite direction straight towards the crowd. It was like a nightmare. The tanks arrived on the street. The tank soldiers saw the crowd and the crowd saw the tanks. The tanks stopped and stayed in place, motors still running. The, cr the crowd, the crowd, crowd could It kept coming, swarming around the tanks. A boy pushed his way through the crowd to the first tank and pushed something through the loophole. 70 minutes, 20 minutes left. It wasn't a grenade, but a sheet of paper. It was followed by others. These sheets were notes in Russian, which started with a citation from Marx. A people that oppresses another cannot itself be free. We counted the minutes, but nothing happened. Then the top of the lead tank opened a little and the commander emerged slowly. <laughs> 
Then he flung the turret open and sat on the top of his tank. Immediately, hands reached out to him. Young people leapt up on the tank. The crowd erupted in frantic cheering. The crowd sung the Hungarian national anthem and at the tops of their voices, they cried, long live the Soviet army. Yet these were the same people who 15 minutes earlier had determinedly chanted, Russians go home. My deputy and I exchanged glances. Although we were soldiers, the theory of our movement bypassed caste, nationality, personal interest and prejudice. A word from Marx passed through a loophole was stronger than a tank directed against a crowd. So we should never let pacifists tell us that we are unrealistic when we demand the arming of the working class and the splitting of the army. It has been done and it can be done again. And it is proven to be the only way to fight imperialist methods of war. But we should also emphasize that the splitting of the army is not a one act drama. it must be pursued as a conscious policy. And not left purely to the spontane spontaneity of the masses, which can only have a temporary impact. as it did in Venezuela, in Italy and in Hungary. The struggle to shatter the repressive forces of the bourgeois class requires continuous organization and strategy. In the political, industrial and military spheres And that includes, for example, elected soldiers committees to solidify and, and widen the break between the ranks and the officers. This was the policy pursued by the Bolsheviks in 1917. who agitated in the trenches and in the barracks. And this way they drove a wedge between the army ranks and the officers. <laughs> 
and they shattered the ability of the Russian ruling class to fight either the imperialist First World War or to crush the revolution. Now, do, do nuclear weapons change the Marxist approach to peace and war? Why should we win over the soldiers and arm the workers, for example, when a nuclear third world war could be started by a handful of generals? We must remember that war is waged for material gain. Nuclear war will not bring economic gain, it will just bring total destruction. It does not conquer new markets, it destroys them. There has not been a third world war uh, now, yet. Not because the imperialists have been convinced of pacifism. nor because the contradictions of capitalism have been overcome. But because it is not in their economic interests to wage such a war. But the biggest check on nuclear world war is the working class struggle. Such a global and destructive war would provoke the mightiest backlash by the workers of the world that we have ever seen. The First World War provoked proletarian revolution in several countries against the imperialists and their wars. And today, the international working class is bigger and much more experienced than it was 100 years ago. The balance of class forces, therefore, is more in our favour today than at any other time in history. And that doesn't mean that, that small barbaric proxy wars such as Ukraine in 2014 or Syria since 2011 doesn't mean that they won't take place. They will still take place. As long as capitalism exists, its contradictions will lead to war. The belligerents may not be imperialist powers and they may not have even directly competing economic interests. 
Understand. But imperialist powers generally stand behind such combatants and through them pursue their interests. A direct clash between the major powers is currently ruled out. But this will only intensify the barbarity of proxy wars between nations. And of class wars within nations. And against oppressed groups and oppressed nations, such as the Kurds, for example. But a direct confrontation between imperialist powers is not ruled out forever. Unchecked by the power of the working class. And out of desperation. The USA, for example, the US bourgeois could look seriously at first strike policy against a rival imperialist nation. But before such a possibility could arise, titanic class struggles will take place. The working class will have the opportunity to take power many times before it can be smashed to the extent that it would not be a check on imperialist warmongering. Such a perspective cannot be excluded in the long term if we fail to take power, but as I said, the balance of class forces is on our side. The final question I would like to deal with is will socialist revolution in the modern epoch necessarily be violent? Five minutes left. Force can play a revolutionary role in history. It is through clash and contradiction that society develops, that is through war and revolution. No ruling class in history has ever given up its position without a fight. Capitalist society is based fundamentally on force and coercion. And force will be required to remove it. But does force necessarily mean violence? The ancient Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu 
wrote in his book, The Art of War, that those who render other armies helpless without fighting are the best of all. In other words, it is possible and preferable to win the fight with an overwhelming show of force right from the start to render the bourgeoisie incapable of fighting at all. That requires using our superiority in the class balance of forces. It requires splitting the army away from uh, splitting the army ranks away from the officers and arming the working class. And we should study France in 1968. Or the 1917 October Revolution in Petrograd. and other examples of revolutionary, of revolutionary movements whose force was so overwhelming that violent opposition simply melted away. But this policy requires an absolute purge of pacifism from the revolutionary movement. We must be willing to fight to the end with violence if it is necessary. We hope that it's not, but if it is, we will do so. Our motto is the same as, as the 19th century Chartist movement in Britain. Peacefully, if we can, forcefully, if we must. So finally, to conclude, war and violence between classes and between nations are an inherent part of the capitalist system. Petitions, debates, the United Nations, these cannot stop the functioning of the capitalist system. And so they cannot stop war. Only the proletarian socialist revolution can do that. Pacifist morality is empty and it is poisonous to the revolutionary movement. Ours is a higher morality based on the march of historical progress. And, and this is important, write this down. The only just war is the class war. The only just means of waging it 
are those which really lead to the liberation of mankind. Sum up, please. This is not an abstract question. nor is it confined to one or two countries like Sudan or Palestine. The need for revolutionary force arose in the insurrectionary movement in Chile last year. and it is present in the USA's Black Lives Matter movement today. It will arise in every single country in the coming period without exception. And we must be ideologically prepared to confront it. Thank you very much for listening, comrades.